think music and sound in documentaries is often something that can be very mysterious and the process, the actual creative process between sound designers, between composers, directors and editors and producers in the production is something we don't talk a lot about and it can be, um, it can often be a very, very tricky, fraught, very, um, you know, exciting and creative process and so really getting to talk to directors and composers who have worked together on particular projects um, and really get into the, the nitty gritty of how they worked, how they communicated, how they didn't communicate and um, what some of the pitfalls were and what some of the um, things that really came together in unexpected creative ways. I'm just really excited to get some of those real, real world stories from these two films. Um, so I'm very excited to, from uh, one of us, uh, introduce uh, Rachel Grady and T. Griffin. <laughs> and from What Haunts Us, um, Paige Tolmack and Nathan Halpern. <laughs> and um, since we have these two pairs from these two films, um, I wanted to start with um, having each film uh, talk a little bit about their process and uh, share a clip from that film. Um, so we'll start with Rachel and Todd uh, with a clip from one of us and um, talking a little bit about how that process worked. And then after that, I think we can just go open up into a conversation. So Rachel, as the co-director of the film and Todd as the composer, um, I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about the process that brought you to this final clip and um, a little bit about, you know, like really like the very beginning, like how did this in initial conversations go that mm -hmm. led you to these different, I'm sure, iterations to get to where you got? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so Todd and I are both New Yorkers, and this was the first film that Heidi and I had ever done in New York City. And I think right from the beginning, um, we wanted it to feel like New York. So um, we spent a lot of time on the subway, and um, you know, just so part of our story is how this community, the Hasidic community, interacts with New York City. It's a very isolated community, but New York is the opposite of I isolated. It's, um, you know, multicultural and everything's in your face and you can't avoid people and that's what makes it incredible and messy and New York City. So we were just thinking about that the whole time we were making it and we conveyed that to Todd and he agreed that it needed to feel we needed to feel the city the whole time. Um, we also didn't want the um, music to feel, you know, ethnic, Jewish ethnic. So that was something that was off the table right away. No fiddler on the roof for us. <laughs> um, and that's the beginning of the conversation. And then Todd, I feel like he totally translated what we were looking for, and I think you started by recording a lot of wild sound in New York, and that was kind of that was a good that was a good sign. Todd got it. Like we were on the same page in terms of um, there was a lot of characters in the film, but New York City is definitely one of them. You know this. Um all of that is true, and I think one of the things that made, there was a lot of creative decisions that happened um, to get you know, this opening little sequence to what you hear now, but the concept, um, you know, the concept of what we were doing, and, and particularly in what this opening meant, you know, what the storytelling of the opening was, was consistent, you know, basically from our very first uh, spotting sessions. Um, which is that yes, this this is about you know a uh, a society within a society that is trying to be sort of impermeable, but there's all you can't be impermeable in New York, and so there's all of these kind of like um, these sounds and ideas and stuff that that sort of are are threatening this community, and so we wanted to find a way to sort of get the sense that both we are kind of as an audience being um, sort of stepping into this oh, forbidden world and also that this community that's at the center of this was having you know ideas and sounds and 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 things they see sort of assaulting them all of the time as well and 
the first thing I think that we got excited about is I just went to Williamsburg and I just started recording stuff um, and just started making like sound collages um, and and a lot of that material is ends up in sort of the background and the sound design and also in sort of parts of the composition that I did for this for this opening. Also, Todd wasn't afraid of the fact that the design was part of the music and had that was cool because sometimes you know I mean this is the thing with collaborating with another artist so you've been working with artists the whole time as a director you're working with a DP then you're working with an editor and then there's this this last artist that's coming on board and um, it's just it's a weird relationship because everyone's been working together all this time and then the composer needs to jump in last one on and, um, you know, I, I think that must be very hard. Um, also, everyone's been dealing with temp music, so you're in love with this temp music, and it's just, it just must be the same thing every time you have to deal with. Um, so, um, I don't know what I was going to say. I had some other <laughs> point, sorry. Um, so, um, I'll come back to it, sorry. I had a really good thing I was building toward. <laughs> Well, I'd love to hear more about the process once you had that as initial conversations and Todd, after you'd gone to Williamsburg and recorded and you had had some conceptual ideas, what was the, the back and forth process with different ideas, like how many different types of uh, cues did you come up with before you sort of came to this direction? Well, th this was an interesting one. I, I, one of the ways I work is I record a lot of music. I, I try to work very quickly and present ideas very roughly to directors. And so all the movies that I work on, I have kind of this sort of backlog of stuff that went a little bit but didn't never made sense. And so I, I forgot about it. And I had actually done these horn recordings several years ago for another movie that I ended up not working on. Um, that I had always really liked and been sort of intrigued by them, and one, and so I, I had posted a bunch of stuff that, just based on our initial conversations, from my sort of archive of of orphan music, I had posted a bunch of things, and um, one in particular, um, they they were like, we love this. What is this? You know, and I was like, oh, it's a movie I got fired from, um, <laughs> and uh, and you know, I, I was like. What, what does it look like? And so they started using that, and it was a sort of an, a version. Yeah, but it's a version of what you hear, that horn uh, thing you hear at the very beginning. Um, and so, you know, I think documentary makers are very used to basically sort of taking from whatever they have available to start, you know, create sort of collaging something together. And so for me, that was really exciting uh, way to start, you know, turning this musical material into something that made sense for this movie. And I think it, we had a very strong concept for this opening, but I think having too much of a strong like intellectual concept and then going to try to compose it can be sort of a, just a dry and not very satisfying experience. Um, so something like this where you have sort of material with its own integrity that can then sort of bounce off a scene um, you know, just sort of create sparks for all of us. That's an exciting way to start working. And I think a lot of the stuff that Todd ended up recording in the beginning, you, it's throughout the whole movie now. You, you hear it like um, on, a, on the title, you hear it, it was the sax, right? The sax that he recorded in the um, subway. So it's echoey and it's the sound in New York City. It's the sound that you ignore after a while. And we, we, it's throughout the whole film. You hear it, it'll come up. And it's kind of like, it's subliminal. Of course, we all hear every single note, but it's a subliminal thing. You're like, in that, in that moment, you're in that co cocoon of New York again, and then it goes away. So you ended up, we ended up using a lot of it. Yeah, and actually that very, that moment where I had built that, this title sequence, um, you know, I was looking back at several of the iterations. I had built it as basically, I kept getting the note, it needs to keep growing. It needs to really go on a journey. The version that I had, we were using, was pretty static. It just kind of had a pretty simple music. It's just, it's just two or three instruments playing this simple pattern that I had sort of ending at the title. And the note I kept getting was like, it needs to 
change, it needs to build, it needs to grow, it needs something needs to happen. And so I kept adding instruments. And so it, there was a point at which we called, the, called it the dragnet effect because I, I kept adding horns. And so in the title, it got, it got to this totally ludicrous kind of uh, one of us, you know, it was completely stupid. I kind of had to get through that to, sh you know, to, to experience that that was a stupid idea. Um, but we were actually sitting in my studio going through things and Heidi suggested, and I had had that kind of like that subway recorded saxophone in the background as like a, as a sound designy element behind the music. And she was like, well, what if that is the focal you know, what if that's what lands us on the title? And I was like, well, there's no possible way that will work, um, but I'll try it. And, you know, we were all just like, crap, that's it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, that's great. That's something I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, you mentioned a lot of the notes you were getting were like, it needs to keep growing. It needs to get bigger. And I often find, sometimes when I'm, especially if I'm talking to a composer and giving notes, the language I'm using is, is if I think about it, is almost like ridiculous. It's always just like, bigger. More emotion here, Momentum. but then so, it, so that sounds silly, but it actually seems to. I think especially for um, filmmakers who, um, you know, w we we want to talk in emotions and let the yeah. composers deal with like, is this woodwinds? Is this percussion? Not to talk in that language, but to, just to talk in these very basic, um, you know, this very basic vocabulary of emotions and size, um, you know, more tension, and then let the composer really come up with that and and maybe you know, come up with three different versions and then production can decide which one works. Is, is that something, like when you guys were communicating, was it m mostly through things like that? Was it often just uh, communicating through sharing music? Well, I, I always feel really badly about that actually because we are speaking a different language or more, we don't know the language that he has. So I always, we always I feel silly when I'm like, eh. I, I don't know how to say it. Uh, that one thing that goes down, oh, I don't <laughs> like that thing. You know, it's just you do end up talking like a simpleton, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think it ends up being on the composer to interpret our sort of childish description. Um, so he's, he or she is a little bit in the dark, and then, then, you, then you get it. Sometimes you can understand us quickly, you know? No, I, I mean, I, I feel like those are great kind of notes. The part where it goes down is bothers me. And, you know, what, and, and so if we can point at it, if we're, you know, both listening to the same thing at the same time, I can say, oh, well, it, it's going up. But, yeah, exactly. I, I, but, but I hear what you're, you know, I hear what you mean. You mean it's going to a minor key or something like that. Or, you know, the, the, that attempt at communication, I, even with, you know, filmmakers as virtuosic as Heidi and Rachel, it's always, it, it, it's, it's never different than that. It's never anything, you know, more sort of, uh, th there's not like a secret code, right? I mean, it's just always, you know, finding the language and pointing to the thing. And I think for composers, or for me at least, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of getting, getting, getting that feedback. Like I always say, it, it, it should be, the process should be like ping pong, it shouldn't be like chess. It should be like, you know, is there anything you hear in this piece that, that you respond to? And taking those pieces that, um, you know, that people are responding to and, and sort of grabbing onto them and then getting rid of everything else and trying to sort of create little uh, flag post for yourself as you go through. And Ria, Rachel, what you said about the filmmakers and the composers basically speaking different languages and then each time it's like trying to find some kind of way to translate or, or you know, make signals in some way mm -hmm. musically or, or through, through um, language that can uh, communicate what you're trying to do and, and have that ping pong process be most effective. Um, I think that's like, that's a theme I'd love to keep returning to because I think that's such a, that's one of the, the, the biggest issues facing, I think, composers and directors. And also when that works, when, like you said, this uh, moment in the, in the room where something that didn't seem like it would work suddenly worked, like that's when that kind of creative friction creates these things that work. Um, so I'd love to turn it over to uh, Paige and Nathan. And um, so that was the opening of one of us. We're, and for uh, uh, Paige and Nathan's clip, we're gonna be showing the, the final cue. And um, Paige is the director of the film and, and Nathan is the composer. Um, I'd love for you guys to show this clip and talk a little bit about it. Do you wanna say anything before? The, my, my film is about, um, it's a very personal film about uh, 
my school where I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, and it's about the sexual abuse of many boys in my high school and the cover-up of that abuse by my school. Um, it was, um, as you can imagine, a very emotional and hard journey to take for me. I spent five years making this film. People are, um, a lot of people are pretty angry at me for making it. And, um, and uh, so the notion of music in it, I what I always said when I met Nathan, what I always said even before I met Nathan was that, you know, people don't really even like to see documentaries. They certainly don't want to see a documentary about sex abuse. So if we're going to make a movie about this and have people sit through it, the music should feel unexpected and it should be able to carry them through. And, um, and I said, I don't really know what that means, but maybe you do, and, um, and maybe we could do that together. Yeah, and <clears throat> one of the reasons that we decided to show this clip for this kind of uh, situation um, was so that we could talk about thematic structure uh, in a film. And again, this is, so this is the very end of the film. Um, but it draws on a theme that we established early on in the film, um, which, and correct me if I have the words uh, wrong here, I think it's a, it's a scene dealing with a reminiscence about the teacher who is the abuser, Fisher. Um, and Paige had uh, discussed a feeling of mournful regret. Is that, or and a nostalgia? There was a sadness. There was just a tremendous sadness about it because when you see the film, you realize that it really wasn't just about this terrible person, but it was really about all of us and how we were all affected and how we all played a role. And that was my sadness about it, and I think that's why I wanted to make the film. And so we sort of had to uh, communicate that with the music throughout. And so to that end, I mean, one of the things that we did um, with this piece, which was a sort of, and this was a motif throughout the film, was the sort of, uh, these, we had these sort of delicate piano pieces, um, which invoked in some ways some of, some of these uh, feelings of childhood, of innocence or memories of childhood, and then they were generally set against very warped sounds, um, which you know were meant to invoke this the way in which this either had been tarnished at the time for the abused, um, or for others like Paige and some of her friends who were largely in the dark about what was happening at the time. This sort of process of looking back and sort of these memories and experiences now having this sort of uncanny, uh, defamiliarized quality. Right, right. sort of like the idea that you would look back and your childhood was a lie. A lot of it was so much of a lie. And also, I, I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. It's one of the most beautiful places in the world. And here was this tremendous ugliness that also existed, and I really we wanted to expose that in, in all of it. So, so here at the ending, having gone through this process of like a real, which is the process of the whole film, which hopefully everyone will see, on Monday, um, you, it's, it's now like this stuff has been faced and this has been part of the process of the making of the film, viewing of the film, and what the characters are doing in the film, really facing these things. Um, and that being a step towards um, a liberation or a transcendence. Um, and so the instance you will see here of this particular theme which closes um, uh, the film and this sort of montage of people talking about the journey of the film. Um, this piece, which we've heard before in other kind of more circular circumstances um, and also sort of set against these darker sounds, now we hear in a cleaner fashion and also as it progresses, it begins to sort of modulate and seem to sort of invoke this feeling of the, a step towards the breaking of a cycle. Um, and one other thing to the question of temp music and all that stuff, um, and this something we can get into both in terms of temp music and source music. Um, this was tempted with a version of the Pixie song, Where Is My Mind, it was the, which le it led into the actual song. Yeah. It's an instrumental. Um, I think even in the instrumental version, quite recognizable. Right. Um, and- uh, Unexpected for a, <laughs> and for a movie about this, yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> totally. Right. Um, but not, if you want that, I mean, the thing with that sort of music, right, it, the, there's no replacement for that, that it, because it's not, it's a piece of very beautiful music, but it's also a reference, it's intertextual in some way, you know, there's all your associations with that song. Right. Um, but anyway, we had just sort of tabled that question completely, and this, we did wind up doing this ending scene towards the end, and we also discussed, I think, with our excellent music supervisor, uh, Willa Udell, who was a big part of our conversational process, um, 
this idea of using this theme here. And so I would say, when we got into it, there was no like, ah, oh, but could it be a little more like yeah. the Pixies? Like, that was not <laughs> right. part of the conversation right. at all. And I, I do think that um, getting a thematic structure in place um, is a big way to liberate one from these sort of temp questions, because by that point, you know, just one individual scene taken by itself, you could do 500 different ways and they could all be wonderful in their own way, but, you know, a film is this one thing, it's a gestalt, it's, you know, it, it all has to kind of uh, work as a totality. Um, and so, in that context, um, you know, the thematic structure was, was helpful in that way. Great. All right, let's watch this clip from What Haunts Us. Uh, one um, thing in this film, which I think is something that um, a lot of documentarians, when they're thinking about score, have to face is when the subject matter is already so serious and heavy, how do you approach the music um, in a way that doesn't, um, you know, because music is already s can be so clear emotionally, and I think there's often the pitfall of like sort of doubling the emotion with the music that's already there in the footage. So how did you guys, did you guys talk about that? How did you sort of navigate that process when just the stories, the emotions of the, of the footage itself and the film itself were already so heavy and serious? Well, I mean, that was one of the first things Nathan said to me. You know, he was like, we sat down, we met here in New York, I was in New York, and we sat down, he said, you know, this is heavy. <laughs> so there are moments where we're not going to use music. And there are moments to really be respect things. And I'll help you figure out what those moments are. Because my tendency was like to put music in and temp and all that. He was like, let's just let's take a step back here. And so, so um, you, have to let the, you have to let the movie play for itself. And these characters speak for themselves. And, um, and you know that. You feel that sometimes when there's music. And you're like, wait, that's really fighting with what's already there. Um, so you have to. You know, I learned you have to sort of step back and let the movie say what it needs to say. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, one of the, uh, we, we can come to that, the song that you found earlier, we can get yeah. to that in a second, but um, <clears throat> we had the idea to, we're, we're a, as much as possible, and we sort of discussed this a little bit earlier in setting this up to, um, to play, there, there, are, there are some cues in the film that, play a little bit more expositional, procedural, you know, unraveling of things. But um, by and large, we sought to have a more reflective approach um, that spoke to um, the sort of uh, deeper impetus uh, for the film itself that dealt, again, with these sort of questions of childhood and reminiscence um, and, um, and sort of placed it in that more sort of personal space so we weren't just like, music, the sound of molestation. Um, um, so that was part of our, our setup for that. And then um, a, another thing that when, when we first talked about the film, one thing that was in place right from the beginning um, was a very beautiful song um, that Paige had found that plays in the opening credits, which we can talk about the ways in which it um, uh, influence and was a uh, kind of a cornerstone for other aspects of the score. Did you want to? Yeah. Well, I, I, for I, I, again, I worked on this movie for five years, maybe a little bit longer, and um, I kept saying, you know, again, I, we have to get people to sit through it. We have to get people to sit through it. So the music has to be really unexpected. Like I want to open up with like an '80s song, like Duran Duran. I mean, I was I don't know what I was doing, but I kept putting that in there, and it wouldn't. It was unexpected and it got you to sort of sit there but it wasn't right and for a couple of years I was like God, how am I gonna find this opening song what's the opening song and literally one day I went to go pick up my son from school who was in third grade a few years ago and um, I'm walking onto the elementary campus in Los Angeles and the seniors were um, getting ready for graduation they're graduating and I just walked on to go get Jackson, and I heard the most beautiful song. I heard these, these girls just singing this song, and I was like, wait, that's it. That's my song. And I just went up, I was like, who's that? And I took the musical director at our school, and he introduced me to these lovely young women who, um, who sounded like angels to me. And they had written this song for graduation, um, a love song to their classmates, to their friends, called 13 Years. And um, they... Um, it was it. It felt, it felt to me like how I felt about my friends. Because as hard as this movie was to make, as much as people don't like it, it's literally a love letter to my school, my community, my friends, because I love them. And um, this felt like a love letter to me, and it felt like the innocent um, 
innocent sort of way in, and that was the song. That was the song, and I didn't even know if I'd made the right choice. Or I was crazy. I didn't know what. And then Nathan said, "Oh my God, I love that. Let's let's take that and and, and work off of that." It's it's a very beautiful, very simple song. Also, she you were able to get this just like this, like very raw, like I said, I want sing it, sing it into an iPhone and send it to me. That's how I want it. I wanted it that way, and they did. And it has, you know, the sort of, it's just, you know, these like beautiful um, female vocal harmonies and it's this very sort of simple pop piano chords, very plaintively simply played. Um, and I think the quality of that and this very nostalgic, very sweet quality of that was something that informed a lot of what we did. And so um, obviously most of the score doesn't, if we were here, we wouldn't be like, oh, how sweet and lovely. But underlying it, um, not to get too musician-y in the talk about this, which I'm loath to do, but <laughs> much of the um, sort of musical stuff and the piano and things like that was in fact in major keys. Um, so, you know, ostensibly something a little more uh, positive or nice, but then set again. So the darkness sort of came often in the way it was presented and around it. And I mentioned this already, but it's sort mm. of being warped from the outside. Um, and so that that was something that informed things quite a bit, and also this, you know, this that kind of raw, gnarly yeah. piano, you know, like a schoolhouse piano, slightly yeah. not in perfect tune. Um, so innocent, it just felt innocent. That's what it was. Yeah. yeah. So Paige and Nathan, you um, you live in different cities on different coasts, and I know that's um, fairly common with composers and directors, and I'm sure some of the filmmakers and composers in the audience have worked that way or are going to work that way. Talk about that process and what you had to do to um, you know, be able to still get some of the same kind of you know, creative friction that might happen if you were in the room together that you couldn't get because you weren't. You know, it's just so interesting. This is my first film and I had no idea what I was doing every day. I still don't know what I'm doing, but anyway, it's, um, all I knew was that I had fallen in love with Nathan's music. I actually started making this film. I had a bunch of seasoned people around me who'd made other films. And my producer said, this is, this is a, a composer out here who's great, and he's gonna, he'll help you listen to his music. And I kept listening to this, this amazing composer. I kept listening to his music over and over, and I just wasn't connecting to it. I, and, I, and I thought it was my fault. I was like, something's wrong with me. I don't, I don't, I'm not connecting to the music. She kept saying, oh, no, you will, and he'll be able to do whatever you want. And I was like, but I'm not, I, can't, I don't like any of it, <laughs> you know? And, but, and it was really tormenting me, because here I was, I was the one on the team who didn't, who'd never made a film before, so what was wrong with me? And literally, I sat down one day, and I did what I do to relax, which is I watched the trailer channel on Apple TV for like an hour, and I sat there watching trailers, and the tra I, I, this is so true, and the trailer for The Lovers and the Despot came on. And with, within a moment, I just went, that's the guy. I swear to you, I was like, that's what I want. And I watched it, and I looked it up, and I said, who's this guy, Nathan? And I called him out of the blue, and I said, listen, you don't know me, but here's what I'm doing. And we started talking. We just kept talking, and, and we finally met. I came out, I was in New York, and we had breakfast with my child one day. <laughs> and, um, and, we, and I kept saying, you know, I didn't understand the process. I was very anxious about it. I didn't. I knew I didn't speak the language, and I didn't really know how to express much. But I just knew how I felt and how I wanted my movie to feel. And so I just kept talking to Nathan about that. This is how I want to feel. I want to feel this. Does that make sense? And I don't know. And I'd say the same thing. And he just said, "Okay." And then he went off, and he'd call me Ben, and we'd talk some more emotionally. It was like therapy session with Nathan. And I was like, "Do you need me to talk about anything else in any other way?" And he's like, "No, I got it." And I think, and that was the lesson. Like, he just needed to hear what I wanted. He needed to hear where I was coming from, who I was. Again, such a personal story. So he took those cues and was just magically able to um, create what I wanted. So that was really easy. I mean, maybe horrible for you, but easy for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that, I mean, for me, hearing as much e about the film and the subtext and what it means and the emotions, even if we're not talking about the nitty gritty of a specific cue, for me, that's where all the answers are. Yeah. Um, and that's where I can find what works. So, and because if you're sitting down to write something, even just sort of in the unconscious, like your motivation for writing it has to be the 
motivation that's going to take you in the correct direction. So if that's the incorrect motivation and you're going down the wrong path, nitty gritty things about music, you know, if the clarinet was here and could that be a bass, all of that is, you can figure all that out later, but it's the, the real heart of it. I mean, we call it themes, right? I mean, that's, and that is really what it is. You're talking about like what's really the, the sort of emotional um, and philosophical and thematic motor of the movie and what's sort of beneath the surface. So um, it's, for me, very helpful or the most helpful and most important thing to understand everything that, or as much as, not everything of course would be impossible, but as much as possible about what Paige understands about the film. So I want to open this up to the, everybody on the panel. Um, what do you do when it's just not working? When like a, a cue, like one cue is just, it's just not working and you've maybe tried six different versions and everyone's just feeling like at a loss and frustrated and, and you, you, you know, the filmmakers have run out of notes to give and the composers <laughs> tried everything you can think of. Like, what do you do at that point? Just no music on that part. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot of what your time is spent yeah. with. You know, I went and looked back through all of our notes for this movie, and, you know, we were very happy, I think, with the collaboration the whole time. It felt creative. It felt good. But most of it is, this isn't working. What's, you know, it still doesn't have the you know, momentum. It, it's too muddy. It's fighting with the time. You know, most of the time, it's not working. And I think what... What Nathan is saying is about staying focused on what the overall, you know, arc and what the overall meaning of the story is um, carries you through all of that. Um, because especially if you're working on a movie where the edit is also changing, you know, yeah. things don't work for a really long time. I mean, we didn't get the final cue for this movie, you know, till a week before sound mix, I right. would say. I mean, which is terrifying, but I also, if you have this foundation of sort of understanding of what the movie you're making is, you're gonna know it when you see it. And I think for me as a composer, it's about just keeping getting stuff out there, not, not trying to do the not trying to perfect any one cue. Always trying to get stuff in front of the directors and get their feedback, because their feedback is, that's, that's, that's what is gonna carry you through. It's, um, it's the uh, process, it's just like editing, process of elimination, really. So it n never works, it doesn't work until the last day, because then it's done, <coughs> or your version of done. Um, and I really, I enjoyed. The, this was a great collaboration. It was, it was a lot. This of, was a fun one, right? It but fun. it was, but it was. That's very, you know, we weren't like high fiving the whole time. No, no, you know no. what I mean? No, no. It was, it was like, oh, this is that one that sucked before still sucks, and you've yeah. done like nine yeah. versions of it, and I'm like, yeah, I know it still sucks. But it's also, I mean, like, like Todd was saying, you know, so you're looking for the overall theme of the movie, but each scene has its own thing too. So each scene is, is telling you something. And it's the whole of these scenes that make the movie. Um, so sometimes there is um, things that contradict your theme, you know? Um, but it still has to sound like the rest of the movie. So, and also when you're, st we're still, I've never had the luxury of having someone cut, uh, write to a locked picture. I've never done that. So we're also, when he's not around, trying to figure out what's not working about the film besides the music, you know? So they're all kind of happening at the same time. And I remembered what I forgot before, <laughs> which is maybe irrelevant now. But, um, <laughs> but um, so also directors are really, um, I think also kind of um, anxious, et cetera, about the music because in the end, the music is the director playing their hand. So there's a lot of things you can't control, like your character or what they say or what happens in real life or how a court case goes or whatever. But the music, everyone knows you did that. So you're saying something with that. So people are listening to the music to hear what you, what you meant. 
Um, so it's very important that the composer no is saying the right thing, you know, um, because in the end, composer's gone, editor's gone, the director is speaking for the film, and it's got to mean what you meant. And for composers, the composer has to listen. I mean, that, you know, that, I think that's the biggest um, thing that a, a film composer needs to draw on. That you, if you can't listen, you can't do it. You have to do some other job. And I, I definitely find what you're saying, which is that oftentimes some of the most helpful feedback to the composer is what you don't like. Like, it's all, it is that, like, winnowing away, like, I didn't like this, I didn't like that. It almost, like, it lets you see what's left. And it also, I think, lets, um, and I'd love to hear the composers talk about this, it helps the composer understand the director's mindset and taste and vision. Like, part of it is really understanding the director's taste, and a great way to understand someone's taste is to see what they don't like. I mean, I would also say if you're, you know, if when you're trying to figure out, let's say something is not working or you... It needs to be something, and no one really knows what it is. Um, to me, something that I come back to a lot um, is the question of point of view, um, and where is this music coming from? Um, sure. And sometimes, I, I think a thing that will sometimes bum people out is people like, oh, this feels like you know commentary, or it feels like, and what I think that often means is it feels like us sitting there looking at it, sort of being sort of judgmental on the material from the outside, and it feels like our point of view, and here we come in. Um, and in fact, my feeling is in most cases, um, what feels authentic and truthful and doesn't aggravate an audience is if it feels that um, what's being expressed is in fact authentic to the point of view of the you know, character or you know, subjectivity of the point of view from which it belongs. Um, and this, this can be sort of, you know, the sort of omnipotent person versus the character, but that's one thing. But it can also be, and I, I've experienced this before, you know, if there's a scene with two characters, if you, you could play something that's just playing the wrong point of view, um, uh, you know, you're like of, of the wrong character, but that's not our character, that's the side character, and we need to stay here. And, and, um, and you do need to sort of think about that interrog and interrogate that because it's not always obvious. There's a lot of these things where something's playing from the wrong point of view, but like it's playing a point of view, which to that point of view is legitimate, so one might not question it. Um, and I think why it's fun to have these conversations is that some of this stuff, every, you know, the director may know all of this in advance and have the roadmap, but sometimes with the music, you, people don't really know that until you start talking about it or until you start, them. they were just like, I don't know, this just kind of felt cool, we need something here, and this kind of feels right, you know, and then when you start uh, digging into that. Um, so, yeah, again, I think um, uh, point of view can help answer those, those questions uh, in a major way. And Rachel, something you mentioned is you, know, you were working with Todd developing the music while the film itself was coming together. Um, I'd love for, you know, just to open it up to the panel, when um, did you bring in your composers, and, and can the development of the music inform the development of your movie, the characters, the, you know, as you're cutting, even as you're shooting. Um, yeah, how can music sure. affect that? Absolutely, I mean, we were cutting, we were changing editorially right to the end, but we did have a good amount of time, which was great, it was a few months. It was three months, I yeah. think. It, and yeah. that's, as, that's as healthy as I've ever gotten. Sometimes it's six weeks and it's not pleasant, you know? Um, so we were able to, I think, to pull out, to, you were helpful. I mean, one of our characters, we were like, for no obvious reason, I was like, he's punk rock. And you understood what we meant about, by that. And, you Interpreted know. that in very dumb ways and <laughs> many different dumb but it, cues. But, it, but, but we got to it, you know, and it's, and he, but you know, as you said, you, you are forced to articulate, um, you're forced to articulate and intellectualize feelings and then you have to translate it back into a feeling so that is kind of what the process is and um, sure if you have the time your composer is just another creative mind that can help you but if you're rushed to do in, in six weeks or a month you don't have that luxury you just you know I, it's it's a much more it's not as nuanced I don't think you get that opportunity I, I also um, should 
mentioned that you know there's other people in this. I mean, there's Heidi, who is Rachel's co-director, but there's also two editors, Inat and JD, and they're also you know we're all churning this stuff. And one of the interesting things, partly because we had the time to play, that they asked me to do is they said, can you send us stems? As I was doing my test, you know, basically just test stuff. Some of it not even to picture. I said, could you send us you know that? Q, but split into its elements. So it stems, if you don't know, just means you basically have five stereo tracks that when played all together sound like you know the Q, but you can isolate the piano, the horns, the drums, the sound design, whatever. And so I would send that stuff, and Inat or JD would take one stem and throw it underneath a scene and sometimes slow it down, sometimes like cut it up, do whatever, and then that would become this floor for the scene that I could then take and and riff off of. So it really became this sort of improvisatory, in, instinctual thing that um, you know that's one of the benefits to working as the as the editors are still sort of locking the picture together. And we also had a wonderful sound designer and mixer. He made everybody look good. Mm. Lou Goldstein. Just have to give him a shout out. He did a great job. And um, just it, 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 it's a whole other ball game when there, there's a lot of cooks mm -hmm. in this kitchen. So um, we're lucky that we finished it, actually. <laughs> I, I very opinionated a, people. Yeah, and I think that's a great point uh, is that um, in, in the films I've worked on with Todd, we've worked this way too, where um, in the edit room, we would take cues or stems that Todd had sent, really reorganize them, sometimes like put them together and you know, just take two different tracks and superimpose them or cut up lots of different pieces and then send it back. And then that would be, that, instead of sending notes, like that would be a way to communicate. Mm -hmm. And then you know, we wouldn't actually use that sort of Frankenstein's monster, but that was a way to communicate to the composer, here's some, here's some ideas we're thinking about and then you know, you could come back with something different, but that had been inspired by that direction. And that allows you to be much bolder. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you edit, editors will do things that don't make any musical sense, yeah. you know, but they make emotional sense. And I wouldn't necessarily have the, you know, I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't put it together that way because you know there's just all sorts of musical rules that that doesn't make sense and it wouldn't feel satisfying. But combined with everything else going on, it does make sense. And editors and directors know that when they throw something in there and it sparks something um, so that it just creates a whole different sort of avenue of freedom for, for composers. I just want to say something that, you know, Nathan's work really inspired me. As a, I changed part of the ending of my film because of his, I mean, that's, I still see that, that your, your composition and I'm just like, I get so, I still get emotional about it. It's exactly what I was, I feel about what happened in my past. And I wanted this film to somehow feel triumphant with our character at the end, but it's still so heartbreaking. There's never any great triumph. Um, but I remember hearing that and being like, oh my God, that is it. And it really inspired me. I think we went back and shot some more things and, and added Gary at the end. It just felt so right. I wanted to keep as much of that song in there as possible. Um, but that really ins that inspired the filmmaking. I mean, his music. So. It was just, it's incredible what that, what that can do. Great. And um, on that note, I'd love to open it up to our audience for questions. Just, you can just raise your hand. The question is, if you're thinking about licensing music, um, how do you think about that in terms of integrating it with, you know, there being composed score? How do you, how do you deal with licensed music going into a, a film? Well, we don't license too much music. We mostly do original, but usually every film has probably one to three kind of, um, big licensed pieces and usually we end up just they just really are bold and on their own and have their own thing it's not it's really hard to you know um, to mix grizzly bear with <laughs> with a score you know so you know the way that I've we've dealt with it is just to have it be its own thing instead of trying to be part of this cohesive thing it, it, it's you know it's like painting a wall green in the middle and it's just saying, okay, this is green. Don't, don't try and make it match. Um, that's just, I mean, that's how we've dealt with it. You know, it's usually like the last cue or something, you know, something that can just stand on its own. That's what we did with Jesus Camp. The last cue was 
a ridiculous, tongue-in-cheek, kind of obnoxious song. <laughs> And sometimes that can be jarring, actually. We had, Nathan actually had to compose to We Have Good Times Roll in our film. And um, was it that one that we had to come out of was a Good Times Roll? Yes, you did. There's a scene where we're like, you know, Good Times Roll, high school, and we're getting into the really ugly part of it. And Nathan had to figure out how to move us into that. And I remember hearing that in the editing room, being like, oh my God, that was perfect. Like, that was exactly got us into the rest of the movie because it's not a fun film. But that moment had to feel fun so that it could lead us to show us how unfun the rest of it was, and he did that. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say there's two things. I mean, one is, if you're talking about licensed music, I mean, one thing is if it's sort of songs and known songs versus just some piece of music, which may or may not be recognized. I mean, as we were sort of talking about before, a pop song is sort of, it's music, and it's in the soundtrack, but it's, it's sort of an intertextual thing, right? Because it's almost like also, like having a film clip from, you know, Shane or something. Right. Like, it's, it's also carrying, other information, it's carrying lyrical information, it's carrying everyone's pop cultural associations and memories. Um, so that's always a thing to keep in mind as far as that stuff goes. Um, it doesn't, I, I mean, I think the, the pop music, let's say if it's that kind of thing, and I'm, I'm working on some stuff now where this is a uh, an issue potentially, I think they don't necessarily need to be part of the same world at all. Um, but they do have to interface in an elegant fashion. And like what you talk about with Jesus, can I mean, if there's like an, you know, a big ironic statement that's in sharp contrast to other stuff, like that's one sort of aesthetic maneuver. But then there are others because again, the, the lovely song that, that Paige found for this film, that's at the beginning, that really is very much in dialogue with the, with the score. And that was, um, again, that was there before any score was there and we did I was inspired by that and cued off of that in a lot of ways. Um, uh, on the other hand, that's not like a known pop song. No one's ever heard that song before. Um, so those are things to think about there. Great. Next question, right in front. So the question is, uh, if there's been tent music that's been in the cut for a long time and then the composer comes in, and especially if there's a lot of emotional connection or resonance that's built up by ha living with that music for so long, how does the composer tackle that and, and um, you know, find a way to move beyond the tent music? Yeah, we, exactly. Do we, uh, that's, a, that's such a good question. I remember we had all this music um, and all this temp stuff that I was just thought it was so great, and, but we couldn't use it. And so then, um, what ha I remember this. I, I would come to the editing room every day, and my, Derek was my editor, an amazing uh, editor. And he, <laughs> Derek would be playing music. I'd be like, you know what, that's good. What is that? He's like, it's Nathan. And I was like, what, really? He's like, yeah, I did put, it's Nathan. And every day, I'd be like, that, that sounds so cool. I like that. Who's that? He's like, it's Nathan. <laughs> and it was just all stuff that Nathan had done. And, other, and so it's almost like he, I, he eased me into it. And then it was that, I realized that was it. it was, but you have to sort of wean yourself. That's exactly the perfect word. You have to wean yourself off of it because you become really attached to it. It's temp music sucks yeah. <laughs> for yeah, composers. Exactly. And it sucks for directors. <laughs> it's a, it is a crutch. I mean, I, I think that even as you're, you know, because not only does maybe the temp music work in a really great way, but it also, you know, you had the experience in the edit room of, you know, when you put this piece of music there, finally your film started to make sense. And so you're carrying all of this baggage that the audience doesn't have. The audience doesn't care. The temp music is not that great. It's not that great. Your feelings about it are wrong. Um, and when you have a cohesive score, even though that scene might not have some little sparkle of grizzly bear magic that it had that you responded to, the audience doesn't care. That's not what the movie's about. So it is, I think that directors have to be a little harsh with themselves. Um, uh, because, and then you are taking this piece of music that grizzly bear 
rented a house in Man Nantucket and spent six months, you know, with you know a Pro Tools rig in every room recording and to get some magical moment that's now in your movie. And then I'm gonna be in my basement doing, you know, 14 different cues over the next six days to present to you. This isn't and personal one of, at all. <laughs> there's no, I don't know why Grizzly Bear came up. But, um, <laughs> but, but you know, and, and then start putting rough stuff in front of it. You know, that's not going to sound like I rented a house in Nantucket because I didn't. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's a, it's a challenge for everyone, and I think it's something to prepare yourself as you prepare for the, the, you know, the experience of replacing the, the temp music you've used to start to assemble. And it's good if you're doing this before your picture is completely locked. Um, then it's then it's really hard. And it's hard for you know composer. If I'm sitting, look, I mean, I've worked on locked pictures a lot, and it you know it's a really different experience. And I feel like there is a spark of creativity that is denied the whole project when you're replacing temp, which is what you end up talking about. Yeah, and then we referred to this earlier. I mean, my only other suggestion about this, other than everything that Todd said, which I amen uh, massively, um, would also be that. Process-wise, maybe that thing that you're so obsessed with, maybe don't start your process with your composer <laughs> tackling that first thing because everyone will be unhappy and you'll be right. banging your head against the wall. It would be much smarter to go around other where, I mean, I often like to start in sometimes in less significant scenes or just some, just start finding your palette, start planting your flags, and then you start to have your big picture together. And then, as in our case, by the time you go to replace, you know, something that, again, like, you know, Pixies, I would say, is I prefer to Grizzly Bear personally. <laughs> um, and uh, but but then at that point, it it can, if you're lucky, then become irrelevant at that point because um, you know it will the 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 gestalt and overall thematic structure will kind of speak for itself emotionally, and that will kind of make everyone feel good. And it and it really legitimately will be better than just some random. Uh, outlier that's not part of things anymore. It will be better for the audience. Temp also allows you to point at things and say, well, this is what I like about that. This is what the emotion I'm getting from is. Uh, and that actually is very useful. So your temp doesn't suck. But you have to use it right. It, you have to use it to point at stuff and try to express what you know. And we did this with the grizzly bear. Uh, you know, we had a lot of. There was a grizzly bear song at the end of one of us that was one of the last things that I managed to you know kick out. And, and there was, you know, it was an incredibly nuanced, instinctive discussion. And different. All four people, all five people, including me, had a different response to the piece. But it was doing something important. There was something really important to talk about in the way that piece of music worked, the sound of it. And it actually did influence a lot of stuff about the whole way the score is. So your, your temp doesn't suck. <laughs> Somebody in the back. The question is about when not to use music. Um, it's, in, well, I mean, I should say, first of all, it's incredibly subjective um, and uh, varies completely from film to film. There, there are a couple of um, uh, thoughts that I sometimes have as sort of rule of thumb kind of things, but they're constantly violated. Um, so in, in, a, in a good way. So, it, so one thing, for example, um, would be, you know, often sort of montage kind of stuff can often force you into music, sometimes even if it's not your first choice, just because structurally you need something to glue things together. Um, uh, that can happen. I would say often it's at least worth looking at in, I find, in sort of a sort of clean, more pure kind of verite scene, it's worth at least as a starting point seeing if it can play, you know, with um, sans music. That's something that's often worth looking at. Um, uh, in the films that, that I've worked on, I, I find that often the films that are more pure verite and don't have much with the talking heads and archival and stuff like that um, will tend to be um, less scored. Um, this film is, is a lot of talking and a lot of stuff like that, and there's a pretty goodly amount um, of music uh, running through it. But um, So that is, is sometimes a, a place to start. 
but again, that can totally depend because um, it's one of us, which the, the music is amazing, the film plays amazingly, it's a lot of verite, but you guys have a pretty good amount of music playing through this too. Right? It's yeah, well, pretty wall to wall. Yeah, But you know, uh, right up through the end, through the mix, you can start, you realize that certain things should just be lower or you start messing with the stems a little bit and thinning it out. I think a lot of that happens. Um, not so much like suddenly the music would totally drop out, but that really all you need is just <coughs> a floor and not any kind of commentary whatsoever. So um, I don't think the composers are crazy about that, but um, you know, you you you're you're with the content of the film until the very end, and sometimes you're just tweaking. You know, well, you don't think the composers are crazy about what? Take, taking their music out. Oh, no, I love it. I <laughs> you think do? you should always go to the mix with too much music and just start chopping. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. Because once you're not dealing with, um, you know, raw, rough sound and once the sound design right. and that whole sound world is there all and you're... There's extra stuff. There's all this extra stuff. You should go with too much and then, then right. cut it out. Oh, yeah. I'm, I, I, most composers love it. You really? When you, oh, yeah. Yeah, and to yeah. David's opening point... We're always scared point. to do it. <laughs> oh, God. You should have talked... I, yeah, <laughs> we're, get, we're getting it out now. No, and I will often have mixers be like, "Why are you telling me to pull this out? Aren't you the composer person?" I'm like, "No, turn them. We have to get in a little bit later. You know, sort of ease our way in. You know, entrances and exits are are very big. You know, even if it's just a matter of like four seconds can make all the difference between something being distracting and irritating and like, and here comes the music. You know, versus coming in and out in a in a graceful way. I mean, those sort of silences are very musical." Um, in their own way, but I would say to David's original point, which opened everything up, which is the question about sort of being re of redundancy, um, that, that that often is a good thing to look at if, if, you know, ideally, if there's not some technical issue, like the sound is just terrible, or this, you know, we just need music to kind of cover over these flaws, if that stuff is able to be fixed in the sound mix or the edit or whatever else, then ideally, you know, music should be dialing up and dialing into some subtext which isn't, you know, already there. Um, it I should have a purpose. I also find in a lot of scenes that don't have music that you end up deciding not to score, that the, um, like if you have a long verite scene with no score, that the music that follows isn't just scoring that scene, it's actually scoring the scene before. Mm -hmm. So y even though there's no music there, the music that follows a long period of quiet, you, you have to look at them together as a totality because it actually is affecting how your mind is processing what you just saw. Um, any more questions? Yeah. I have a business question for Rachel. Okay, Rachel, yeah. who owns the music at the end of this collaboration, or could it have been your other movies? So the question is, who owns the music um, after it's done? Well, we usually make a deal with the composer that they can own the music. I don't know what other people do, but usually they have more use for the music than we do. Um, unless you're doing something for Netflix. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> because they have, and some, some, um, some uh, distributors and some broadcasters have their own con contractual thing they want, they deal with with the composers. But um, we're always, we're, we're happy to let people just, you know, reserve their rights and do what they want with it with sort of a gentleman's agreement that you're not gonna use the best, most prominent cue that they did for your film to be that for another movie, which is kind of a bummer. Yeah, generally, the, when I deal with independent productions, um, you know, I, I own the music afterwards, and you know, we have a gentleman's agreement that I'll ask if I'm gonna relicense it. Um, but when you're dealing with broadcasters like For Life Animated or For One of Us, um, uh, the A and E or whoever Orchard owns the score for Life Animated, and Netflix owns the score for One of Us. And there will never be a soundtrack. And I get emails asking me, "Oh, hey, you're going to put this out?" And I was like, "Oh, yeah, I would love to, but I can't for either of those movies." So, yeah, that would be it's my. It's not a money making <laughs> thing. It's just I, I would like the music. I mean, I can't technically couldn't put it on my website. Right, even on the website. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, same thing. I just did one of these uh, Netflix films, the film on Jim Diddy, and the same thing. It's not in that case for Netflix. It's not even a conversation. Like you're not 
it's it's not one of these kinds of deals. But again, oh, it's a conversation for uh, <laughs> um, for uh, for independent stuff. Again, these sort of licensing type arrangements, I think, are quite um, are quite common. So the question to the composers is: um, Do you hate, or how do you feel about when a director or producer says, you know, we like, we want it to sound like this other composer, or Philip Glass, or Hans Zimmer, or whoever? Well, we want it to sound like sucks, but uh, we love this and we're inspired by these elements of this composer, particularly if it's someone that I wouldn't, you know, that you wouldn't necessarily think of one of us as, as sort of being like. That's totally exciting to me. I love that. So it's kind of like the language of couples therapy. Like if you say, I want that, it's bad, but I, this, this is how I feel about this is good. <laughs> Yeah, I, exactly. I, I was complete. I was really obsessed with a piece of music from uh, a friend of mine created a show called The Leftovers, and I was completely obsessed with the the music from The Leftovers, and um, and it I thought it was quite beautiful, but not. But what mostly I felt was that The Leftovers is a show I don't know if many people have seen that, but um, it's a show that you have no idea what's happening until you hear th the score. For me, I was like the second I heard the score, I was like, oh, this is what this is about. And so I said that to Nathan, I was like, <clears throat> it's extraordinary music, and I understand what this is about now emotionally. And now I understand music better, and that's what I want to convey. And so he, I think that was helpful, you know, and I guess, and, and he took that and made it, made it his own. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and your question also speaks to the sort of whole temp music thing that right. we've been talking about, too. I mean, I think if you were to mention a composer, I mean, you might then dial in a little bit further, it might say something about the palette for the film. Um, just if you're talking about, for instance, certain like classical composers, that could at least be saying, okay, we're talking about a more classical kind of score. We're not talking about something, I mean, even just, that could speak to something very big picture and could be a useful reference. Um, and also bad temp music can kind of be good too, or not, not even that it's bad music per se, but inappropriate, I should better say. Uh, temp music can sometimes even inform like, okay, you know what? Percussion does not work in this movie. We can't hear the dialogue or something like that. Or, I mean, you know, there could be some very general, broad-reaching things that could come out of stuff like that for, for good or ill that could be worth talking about. So I would say with something like that, um, that could be the beginning of a conversation, but you might want to interrogate that a little bit further than just a composer, because that could mean a lot of things. Great. Well, that's our time. So we um, really want to thank our panelists so much for this discussion this morning. And thanks so much to our audience for coming out to Doc NYC. Thank you guys so much. Uh -huh.